Three up, two across, tap that play button three times and walk through the archway into Dialogue Alley. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Dialogue Alley is a show about Harry Potter books, book translations, and all other things magical, including movies. I'm Eric from Nocturne Eric, and with me is Carly. Hello. Hi, Carly. And Melanie. Hi. (laughs) Uh, um, I should probably mention Carly's uh, from all the pretty books, and Melanie's from the Harry Potter collection, but kind of... uh, Miss that opportunity in the initial <laughs> go through. But I, I, wah, wah. Wah, wah. But I, if you've listened to the show before, you already know that. Uh, but if you haven't, welcome. We're so glad that you're here to listen to us talk about Harry Potter stuff. Um, the three of us are Harry Potter book collectors. We collect translations, we collect unique cover art. Some of us collect signed and rare copies. Um, we really love Harry Potter books. So those are the things that we collect. That's yep. right. And. Yeah, and that's that's who we are, and we're wonderful. Aw. We this are. Boost, you're boosting us up today, huh? <laughs> I was going to say, you're both so wonderful, but I'm like, well, if I'm going to say that, then you just have to say that you're wonderful, too, and I'll just say it and get it all out of the way. There Gosh, you go. Yes. Well done. There we go. Like a true Ravenclaw, you thought it through. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I thought it through. So today, we're actually going to not talk about books. We're going to talk about um, movies, and specifically the first movie uh, we've watched it again recently, within the last week, and we are going to uh, sh- a little share our thoughts on that because until now, we've only really talked about books and translations. So uh, we're going to kind of cross media forms here into the motion picture realm. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to go over some quick news. And after we talk about the movie, we're going to talk about the translation of the show. And if we have time... We will get to our question of the show. And if we have time, is always conditional because more or less we don't get there. <laughs> but we always try. We always try. And we do and if read we don't, them. Then we, we do read them. And if we don't get to it, we come back to it at a later date in usually one episode where we answer lots of questions. Yes. Which I actually kind of like doing it that way anyway. But yeah, that's just me. Yeah. Well, should we jump into the uh, into the news here? Yeah, let's do it. So, in the news, we had the release on the fifth. It was a Thursday of the SDCC um, Funko Pop. It's Harry with uh, uh, with the key that was released on the fifth for fourteen ninety nine at Barnes and Noble. Um, he's not available online, but you can go to the store and order him if you're in, or buy him if you're in the U.S., if they have supplies, of course. Yeah, it's pretty easy to check online, too, um, and just, like, type in your zip code, and it'll tell you what stores have them in stock. I know I will be going on my lunch break tomorrow to pick one up, because I need one of these. Yeah. (sighs) Tell me what you think of him. I'm on the fence. I'll let you know. Honestly, I like even just looking at the picture, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like the same mold as the Harry like flying on the broom to catch the snitch. Like literally looks exactly the same as that. Yeah, that's kind of why I haven't put any effort yet. But obviously I need to get it because I have all the other ones. So I have to get it. It, It's fine. I'm just (laughs) accepting it at this point and I'm just going (laughs) to buy it. Well, tell me what you think about him. Anyway. I will. I will. I'm sure it's going to be great. Yeah, you're gonna. You know, there's certain books that I've bought that I'm grumpy about having to buy. So I figure it's I the same we talk, kind that of was, thing. That was one of the questions I think that Melanie and I asked each other. Oh, way back when we, did, we did. Yeah, way when we did that one random episode. Um, Melanie, like, realistically, do you think this will ever end? The Funko Pops. Yeah. Not for many years, I'm afraid. You would think, you would think it would, but the thing is, is that people like me 
started from the beginning, bought them all and have them all and are going to continue to buy them because we need to have all of them. Like there are those people. I am so deep in this that I have to buy all of them now. Right. So here I am buying all the Funko Pops. I mean, are you just wishing that they would say, like, this is the end of this series? But it's never going to be. I... And we're going to start a new one. It's literally the same stuff that we've been putting out, but it is now series two. But they have so many moments to pick from. Right. It It's that... never ending. It's never going to end. I don't know if you follow. There's um someone on Instagram called, like, the daily potter collection i think and they do a lot of concept art for like funko pops a lot of which have actually like been used by funko which is really cool but like that's really cool yeah but they like come up with these outrageous moments and i'm like that could be a funko pop that could be a funko pop oh they haven't done this one yet oh they need to do this one like so many and guess what they're they're gonna over the next however many years eventually get to all of these crazy ones like mer people there hasn't have a funko pop for yet or centaurs any of the challenges or... they've not done any of the challenges for like movie moments yeah exactly like, harry so, getting the egg would be really kind of a cool movie moment i mean they have like harry holding the egg is right one um i want to say that there are a few that haven't been in the movies that are Funko Pops. Could I be making that up? I don't know. I think they're all movie based, aren't they? I don't know. I would have to. I well, you have. Think I, you, you're right. I know. I'm turning around. I don't want to like keep turning like my back because then you could like hear the difference. But. um, Aren't they called movie moments? Some of some of them are movie. um, Are movie moment ones. Um. Now that I'm looking at it, though, I I do think that they're all based on the movie. So I don't think we're going to get any of those, like, book moment ones, That could be in the next series they come up with. Yeah, maybe. And guess what? Guess who's going to buy all of them? Not me. I'm sure Eric will, though. Yeah, I'm going to hop on board. You know, I got a bunch of money just lying around. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. We don't have to worry about, like, college tuition for future children or anything like that. No. Definitely no. not. It's kind of a it's a disappointment though that they're all movies because if you're waiting for like the Stan Sean Pike bragging to the Vila about getting a rocket that can make it to Jupiter or something or that's not going to happen. What, it's never going to happen. What does he say? Um, oh, I, I don't. I, no, Ron I, says. Ron says that I tell you I invented a broomstick that can make it to Jupiter. That's what Ron says. Uh, <sighs> that was such, and they left all the Vila out of the movies entirely. So. Ah, yeah, we don't even, well, do we even really know that Fleur Delacour is part Vila? No, I don't think no, we do. I don't think they discussed because... that in the movies at all. Huh, Since they weird. were left out. Weird that there are these moments that are in the books that are left out of the movies that could mm-hmm. be uh, pretty important. Man, should we talk about it? I think, you know, I think we should have an entire <laughs> episode of a podcast based on just that. Yep. What do you think? All right. (laughs) Let's do it. Okay, so for the main segment, we are going to talk about the first movie. So, depending on where you watched it, it is either Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone or Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Or, if you're like me and the giant blu-ray box that you bought apparently came from the uk because you bought it on amazon when it was on sale (laughs) Uh, and you watched most recently watched the philosopher's stone version which i didn't realize i was until they said it and i was like oh you were like halfway through when you texted us that i I didn't really realize it i was like wait oh it's the they're talking about philosopher's stone and i'm like well i guess they had to reshoot all these scenes yeah which i know they've mentioned but i just didn't realize that was the version i was watching so anyways uh, we all watched the first movie pretty recently, yes. and for me, it was the first time I've watched it while paying pretty close attention in a very long time. Same. I don't know about you two. Exact same. It was uh, it was actually very hard for me. Yeah, I feel like I always, every time I watch the movies now, I overanalyze, especially because I feel like I'm a book snob, but <laughs> like... 
It's true. Like, every single time I watch it, I'm like, that wasn't in the books. Uh, wait, they did this differently. Oh, but that was said like that. So I feel like I always am over. I'm the worst person to watch Harry Potter movies with at this point. The only person I could say is possibly worse than me now is my husband, who is like deep, deep, deep into reading and rereading the series over and over and over again. So now watching the movies with him is like way worse than I think I was watching them. Yeah. He has, he has a lot of opinions. <sighs> Well, I typically turn the movies on as, like, background noise because I know, like, after two and a half hours, I need to move on. I've done this thing long enough. So (laughs) I haven't watched the movies for, like, to pay attention to them. And plus, I don't watch movies well anyway. Anyone who sat and watched a movie with me at a movie theater knows I fall asleep and probably snore. And if (laughs) I'm at my house or a friend's house, I'm either making a cake, doing dishes, making dinner working on my website, something where I'm not just focusing solely on the movie because my I don't do that well. Like because I sleep to I sleep to movies. So when I'm, my brain is like movie time, we're either going to be doing things or fall asleep. It was really hard to sit and watch the movie and not do everything around the house or take a nap. Well, I know what not to do next time you're in the Twin Cities. <laughs> Yeah. Cross that off the list. Sorry, sorry. No movie watching with Carly. I know. Um, <laughs> I actually have gotten into so, – it's how I've never seen Star Wars and it's how I keep never seen like <gasps> Lord of the Rings. What? I've never oh, made it boy. past Tatooine. All right. We're not we're, – this is a conversation for off the podcast. I know. So. Where I shall scold Any, you. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Um, so I, I think it's worth mentioning that – Obviously, all three of us love Harry Potter in general. We love the universe. We love the books. We love collecting. I personally love the the theme parks. I, I know both of you do as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but I will admit the movies, especially rewatching them now, is, it, at least the first one, it was, was not something that I would use the word loved after. It was um, – a little bit shocking to me and and i remember watching the movie in the theater and it was impossible to get a ticket i remember getting a ticket to go either the the day it opened or the next day opening weekend it was during opening weekend and i'm walking out thinking that was like the greatest thing i'd ever seen and i i loved it and i everyone that came out i was like yeah this is great this is great and then i got to about five or six and i was older at that point and I remember thinking like yeah these aren't really as great as the movies but initially that first movie I had such positive memories of that I just went watching it again as an adult like critically was kind of like hmm and not just because of like differences or things that they left out of the book just just in general didn't think it was as good of a movie as I thought of thought it was the first time I saw it so I don't know what do, what do you guys think is your general general reaction before we dive into some details i think that when the movies first came out we were all so eager to see this like in a different medium or experience it in a different medium and like we had read the books and i feel like back when these movies came out it was still in such a time where like it was the beginnings of books being made into movies. Like that wasn't as popular as that is now where now That's it's like, point, yeah. now it almost seems like an, any movie is either a remake or it's based on a book or something like that. And I feel like when or it's a sequel. Exactly. So I <laughs> yeah. feel like when Harry Potter first came out as a movie, it was like a real treat. Like, wow, this book that I love so much is going to be something that I get to see like and experiencing yeah. it in a different medium. I feel like we already like put it on a pedestal and looking at it like through like rose tinted glasses, like you kind of like forgive some of the things that I feel like we're going to be talking about in this episode. You, you, you forgive a lot and you don't necessarily see like, I don't know, back in 2000, like, I didn't realize that the CGI stunk as much as it does when I watch it now. I'm like, wow, the CGI is terrible. Or I didn't really think, like, oh, they left this scene out. No, wait, they left this out. Or wait, they did pretty good with this, but they did bad with this. Like, I I didn't watch it that way. I was just so excited to see these books turn into movies. So Yeah, and I I think by by saying, well, there's 
two things that you just made me think of. The first of which is like, I didn't really think about up until this point, there really weren't a lot of books to movie movies that I've seen. Mm-hmm. But I now am distinctly remembering like, I went to this movie. I went to go see Holes, which I love that book, yep. the Louis Satcher book. Went to that movie. Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. Went to that movie. Like, there are all these books that I loved reading that were now becoming movies. So, yeah, you're right. that This, this was kind of the first time that really became really popular to do. And, I mean, if we loved the book, we'd go to the movie. It's not like if you right. didn't read the book, you wouldn't go to the movie. But most of the people going to the movie – were people that had read the book, whether it was Harry Potter or Chronicles of Narnia series or Holes or, or whatever. Um, Absolutely. Most of the audience was were, were people that had read the book and loved the book. So they were already going in knowing that this was going to be pretty fulfilling for them, just in a sense of, like you said, being able to finally see what we've been reading about and, and seeing it take place in like a, a three-dimensional world that – we don't have to imagine it's it's there. Right. Well, I actually saw the movie first. I was sick with pneumonia and my sister made me watch it. And I saw the movie and I loved it. Granted, I was a lot younger, but I loved the movie. And then, but I loved it enough that I read the first four books because that was out at the time. And I read them immediately after watching the movie, like two or three times on repeat. And watching it now, I have a really hard time wondering how that was able to bring me in. But, and that sounds bad, but it's one of those, like there were just some real problems as far as like gaps in information. And I think too, one of the things is, is that there was so much pressure on the movie to be very good because the books were already running away. Yeah. With was successful. So there was so many or so much pressure to, make them look magical and be magical that I feel like they kind of just threw moments in instead of elaborating and making a better story out of it. I agree. And with the, you mentioned the look, like I love going to the theme park Yeah, in Orlando, right. And and Mm -hmm. riding the train back and forth and and walking around, um, whether it's Hogsmeade or, or Diagon Alley, like being a part of it. I love the aesthetic and the, the look that they went for in the movie. So I think, that was something that the movie really did well right. and made me excited about like going to the wizarding world. I mean, like I'm riding the Hogwarts Express. I'm going to the Leaky Cauldron, yada, yada. Like I'm going to these places and they're, they're really, really cool places to go to in the theme parks yeah. because they're used in the style of the movie. So like I'm really grateful that that happened. So right. yeah, that exactly what you just said. And everything is so well thought out at the theme park that it really feels like you're in your favorite places from the stories, from the movies. And even the books, right? Yeah. Like you, you can go places that aren't really hit on in the movies at all, but they're there in the books. Right. Right. So yeah. you can go to Noc- you can go to Nocturne Alley and spend half an hour like oh, easy. doing the wand thing or like going in Borgen and Burks or just kind of like hanging out there. Like Well, I think of like a good example of that is the magical menagerie, which isn't mentioned in the movies yeah. at all, but right. we know that Hermione gets Crookshanks from the Magical Menagerie and right. I can go to Wizarding World of Harry Potter. I could go to Diagon Alley and if I go straight and make a left, there there it is. There's right. a magical right. menagerie. It's one of my favorite stores. Yes, it is. I remember going in there with you and watching <laughs> you just like, oh. I know, because it's all plushies and animals and care of magical creatures, I think, would be one of my favorite classes if I were to take a class at Hogwarts. But I love yeah. that store. But yeah, it's a perfect example of, okay, this is not in the movies, but it's from the books. And it's another way that we can experience it. Right. One one more thought, I guess, before we dive into like specific details. Um, do you think that people, so people that read the book and liked it, I, the reviews from critics were like overwhelmingly positive. It is a certified fresh movie on Rotten Tomatoes even now, and the reviews I was I was reading, there are a couple that are like, it's a fun movie, you'll like it. It's not the greatest, but then there are other ones that are just like, it, you know is almost an exact copy of the story of the book and that's not a bad thing and it's just stunning and it's so magical and do you think there was just a lot of pressure on people to like the movie because the book was so well received I think that's or conversely oh, conversely 
this is the other half of that. Do you think that there were people that watched the movie and they were like, wow, yeah, this is good. But like, like you, Carly, were like, well, I want to go read the books because it's good, but it's not as amazing as everyone's saying it is that has read the book. So now I kind of want to read the book to find out, like, is this actually amazing or was I just in the minority that didn't like it? I feel like my opinion on it has just changed over the years. Like, that's that's where I'm at. Like, I know when I first watched the movie when I was a kid or even when I first watched the movie after reading the book for the first time in a really long time. Like, I remember thoroughly enjoying the first movie because of the fact that I do feel, even with all the nitpicking that we're going to talk about, like, I do feel like the first book and the first movie are pretty close there are a few details that are Mm -hmm. like very specifically different but there are a lot of things that are direct quotes from the book and a lot of the screenwriting clearly is directly taken from the book and i can appreciate that so much in book one because i feel like you don't see that again until like the seventh movie like i i feel like it takes that long to get back to like oh wait like we're actually starting to quote these books again. Right. Um and yeah, I think that I definitely appreciate the movie in a different way based on like when when in my life I've watched it. Um now I'm definitely more so in a place of like uh I don't really feel like watching the movie. I would rather read the book. I don't know. This bothers me. That bothers me. This bothers me. But I know that like in Five years when, like, my daughter is old enough to, like, appreciate Harry Potter and I get to watch it through her eyes, like, then it's going to take on a completely different meaning for me all over again. Right. So, it... Unless you made her read the books first, and then the, uh, <laughs> the first thing she says to you is, like, how come Peeves wasn't in the movie, Mom? <laughs> You're like, And I'm well... going to say, I did parenting <laughs> right Good job, say, well, why don't you go? Why don't you go listen to episode twenty-two of the <laughs> Dialogue Alley podcast? And she's gonna be like, "Mom, what's a podcast? We only oh, do probably. microchip brain transports of facts nowadays." I don't, know. <laughs> I don't know what's gonna be happening in five years. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> uh well. Anyway, so I I think we should talk about. Matt, we're looking back at this, and, and it's we have kind of an interesting perspective here because Melanie and I read the books first. Carly watched the movie first, but I think when the three of us were kind of talking about this, we were we were mentioning that there is a lot left out of the movie, and no one can deny that. Like that's pretty well talked about on other Harry Potter podcasts. Um, anyone that's read the book and the movie can tell you a handful of things that were left out, but. I think watching it again recently made me realize that the movie relies a lot on you as a person that has read the book to fill in gaps based on what you've read. Right. Or like based on what Melanie said, like the first time you're seeing it on screen, you have this like excitement that you see something and they don't even reference it. And it's actually kind of like a plot point, but they they don't mention it at all. It's just there. So they're, they're relying on you – or the movie relies on on you to go, oh, that's there. So, like, check it off the list. Yeah, I saw it. Right. Just mm-hmm. how I imagined it, right? And, like, watching it now just makes it feel, like, really bare bones almost. Like, there are all these little plot points that the, if you haven't read the books, you won't even notice. And if you don't notice that, I think it really takes a lot of the – I mean, I want to say, like, meat off the bone, because it's not really meat. It's just there, and it's only meat that people can eat if they've read a book. <laughs> Boy, that's a weird <laughs> analogy. You went deep into that one. <laughs> I went deep into that. But do, do you know what I'm trying to say? Like, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Melanie, why, I don't know. You you wrote about, about this part here. Like, yeah, so – when I, I, I don't know, when I think about, like, movies, I have certain movies that I think of in life that are, you watch them one time and you experience it a completely different way than when you watch it the second time. Like, a perfect example of this, and I'm sorry if this is a spoiler for anyone, but it really shouldn't be, is, like, when you watch the movie The Sixth Sense, when you watch that movie for the first time, you are blown away by the twist that happens at the end of the movie. Like, it completely catches you off guard you're like 
holy crap, I can't believe that this is what was going on in the entire movie. Then you watch the movie again, and you watch that movie in a completely different way because yeah. Yeah. you know, oh, wait a second. I know that, like, he's he was dead the whole time. Like, once once you realize that you're like okay now i'm watching it with a completely different lens so think about well and you re- and you realize that everything that was shot in that movie was done with that intent. knowing that right knowing that he was dead and right. so it it's almost like begging you to go back and watch it again right to pick to, to like to really make sure it lines up, up. On these things i mean i feel like that that point is definitely like relevant to what we're going to be talking about because like If you go into watching this movie already having read the books, you're going into it with, like, expectations of what you think you're going to be watching. You go into it thinking, like, okay, Harry's going to be this disheveled boy who was abused and who, like, finds out he's a wizard and we're going to see what happens in there. But the thing is, is, like, when you go back and you're watching it and you go into, like, this nitpicking of it and realize certain things that are left out like as a book reader i feel like we kind of get a little bit disappointed with like when things are left out that could have been put in that really like add to the depth of a character so so like one example like i go back to all the time with the first movie in particular is they they really don't show in great depth how abused Harry was for the first 11 years of his life. Okay, we see he lives in a closet and he wears oversized clothes and he has to cook for his aunt and uncle. Okay, but you don't... Yeah, they give him these... They give him these weird pants. Yeah. I just noticed on my last watch, like, the pants that he's wearing, they're, like, brown and they don't even look like they're, like, pants. It's like they made him out of curtains or something. <laughs> but the thing is, is it's supposed to be, like, Dudley's hand-me-down clothes. You wouldn't think, like, D- they wouldn't put Dudley in all of this, like, no. ratty clothes. It would just be, no. like, nice clothes that would that be very, very him. big on really Harry. Big. Like, yeah. Right. But... I feel like because of the fact that, like, the abuse and all of that stuff is left out, that it makes it a bit, like, a bit strange in comparison that Harry is, like, so willing to accept the fact that, like, he's a wizard. Right. Like, I feel like if he had gone through 11 years of being tormented by his cousin and bullied in school and made to do this and that and everything from his aunt and uncle and bullied and not allowed to talk and not allowed to ask questions and then you have this magical giant with a pink umbrella come knock a door down and say hey you're a wizard like okay now it makes a bit more sense why harry's like oh i'm a what i'm a wizard yeah oh okay yeah i'll i'll come to this magical place and get a wand like that sounds great whereas in the movies i feel like it's just like oh oh okay you're gonna go off with this giant Right. Who just well, knocked a door down I will on a rock. say, um, so I watched the extended version, um, and they have a scene that was cut from the regular version where Dudley's in front of the fireplace. They're talking about him mm-hmm. going to smeltings, and he's in his uniform and all that, and Harry... Oh, yeah, I've yeah, seen and that Harry, yeah, yeah, and Harry's like, he asks a question like, am I going, or what am I going to wear, or something like that, and they're like, you, go to smeltings, and they just start laughing. And then you kind of get a feeling there that, you know, he's horribly disliked and they don't think he's worthy of good education or whatnot. And um, Aunt Petunia is all, well, you know, it's public. It's the state fund or state state schools for you or whatever. Another thing, too, though, is that, you know, in the books, they have Pierce and Dudley going to the zoo for uh, Dudley's birthday But that's completely left out of the movie. So going back to Melanie's point about the abuse, like, we just know that they're going to the zoo together. It can't be all bad. Yeah, exactly. They don't leave out the fact, like, in the books, literally, they were planning on, like, taking him and leaving him in the car. Yeah. Like, oh, we'll just leave him in the car. And then they go, I'm not leaving him in the car. That car's new. Like, they're worried about the car. Right. And not Harry. Harry. Right. So it's not emphasized enough, kind of, which is your point exactly. Mm-hmm. But I, I feel like, again, though, that relies on us as huge fans of the book to just kind of, like, sidestep that and be like, oh, he lives in the cupboard. There it is. Right. They go to the zoo. They're at the zoo. 
um, the letters show up. There are the letters. You know, like he's wearing mm-hmm. baggy clothes. There they are. Like it checks all these boxes that they wanted to check, but it. You're right. It just it doesn't build up that sense of like. It's horrible. It, the the entire like draw to me for this book was like here's this kid that's just has nothing and is treated so poorly and now all of a sudden he gets to go to this world that like people have dreams about doing and for him it's actually a reality and he gets to go right right so it that is a huge like just launching pad for the entire series that that this whole other world exists and it's seems fake and it seems crazy but it's actually real and he gets to go and be a part of it right. and these really horrible people don't and they were like actively trying to prevent him from going to this whereas amazing like place. if you read the books you go into the movies or into the movie disliking the dursleys from the get-go right yeah. you already yeah you you already know that they're not great people right and then but and you may the talk movies about just make them seem like sort of not nice people right. but not bad and people. you may talk about well they left this out they left this out but You know, me, like, since I saw the movie first, I actually did ask my sister because she watched it with me the first go round. I was like, you know, I asked her about them. I said, who are they? Um, And she, you know, she was very young then at the time, too. But she was like, just keep watching. But then she she actually filled in some. She's like, they're really bad. They don't treat Harry very well. Da, 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 da. Because she read the books. So I did have some questions watching that through. I remember that. I think that's a good transition to Melanie. We talked about how they go to the house on the rock right away, right? They like, Mm -hmm. it's like, oh, we got letters. Let's go away. We're going to this house. Right. Yeah. Nothing else. Like like, their first, the Dursley's first thought is we need to get away from these letters. Like, let's go to a house (laughs) on a rock in the middle of nowhere. Right. Like, and that honestly, it seems like a bit extreme. (laughs) <laughs> is, is my thought it's like oh he's getting these letters and the answers to go to a house on a rock but then as even just now just like talking that out loud like that's very appealing to like a little kid audience like oh my god he got these letters and they, they decided to just go to a house on a rock like in the middle of nowhere like that's actually like kind of funny like i feel like it's comical as a kid mm-hmm. i think i think the scene where the letters are coming into the house was actually pretty pretty well done like the way they're just exploding everywhere mm-hmm. but like adult me watching this was like just pick one up off the see, floor see that was man. me like, to hop on. around they're all over they're all over there Stop I know. hopping around <laughs> with swinging your arms in the air and like i actually rewound it because if you look um, he ca- he has one in his hand while he's trying to catch the other ones. Yeah, and, like, pretends that he gets one, and then he runs. So like he has one for about four seconds on screen while he's still trying to catch one. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh man, how did I not notice this before? But that's um, a very common like Harry Potter meme. Is like it says something like how we know Harry's not a Ravenclaw because, like, a Ravenclaw would have just picked up a letter from the floor. Just pick one up <laughs> off the floor. Come on. Um, but, yeah, but that, that's not what I wanted to talk about. But I wanted to go into the next part where they're on the house on the rock. It's his birthday. We know that because they write it on the floor, or he writes it on the floor. And then Hagrid shows up. He's like, you're a wizard. He's like, oh, that's great. Let's go. And then they, like, immediately leave, like, right then and there. It's like, what, midnight? Right. Yep. And they just go. He's like, let's go. All right, let's go. And then they go to Di- uh, Diagon Alley, buy all of his stuff. And then at the end of the shopping trip, he's like, all right, time to go to school. Yeah, See you like that. Bu- oh, I know. That, and then that one bugs me, too. There's a moment. Does he does he read the ticket? Does it say September 1st? On the, Like, does he read that? No. I I, no. Okay. Not in the movie. So that that's probably intentionally why they didn't read that. But. Anyone who knows anything about school knows that school does not start like August well, 1st. But the thing is, is August if you're 1st. if you're watching the movie and don't have this like preconceived or like um what's the word? You don't you don't have this prior knowledge of the Harry Potter books, you don't know that Harry's birthday is on July thirty first. You're That's just like also oh, true. it you must don't be have in the, the timeline. That, you don't have a timeline. Yeah, that is true. I hadn't thought about right. that until you said that, because for all I knew at the time just watching the movie, it could be the day before school starts. I will say, too, there's a moment in the movie where Hagrid's like, now stick to your ticket, Harry. That's very important. Stick to your ticket. 
only it goes nowhere. Like, I was expecting just watching the movie and not reading the books. I was actually expecting, like, Harry to drop his ticket and it explodes. And then he's like, now what happens? You know, because I expected some major drama to happen if he didn't stick to his ticket. And in the movie, like, right when he's saying that, that's when, like, Hagrid disappears. And Harry's like, but it says platform nine and three quarters. That can't be right, Kevin. And he's, like, gone. Like, wait, okay. Like, he couldn't have waited five more seconds till Harry stopped right. talking before he's just like vanishes. Right. He gets him all like, the way. He's asking a, he's asking a pretty important question. He just told him the ticket was really important. And Harry's like, well, I have a question about the ticket. And he's like, say, see, see ya. Okay, I can't <laughs> Bye. Bye. Good yeah. luck. Good luck. I've already answered all the questions that I've been able to. So just you're on your, you're on your own for that one. And then he, he talks to the guy. I think it's technically a porter. Right. right. And he's like, I'm looking for platform nine and three quarters. And he's like, nine and three quarters. You're being funny. And he like walks away. You think like, you're funny, do you? Right. That's, that's what, like, that's it. Like, that. that's the interaction. That's like, one of my, that's not how <laughs> my family's like most quoted kids. lines. <laughs> your mom said, I remember your mom saying that at the park once. I forget. You had that, said something. And she said oh, that we all you. we all say We all say that all the time. Oh, like, my that, best friend Travis all the time is, oh, think you're funny, do you? That makes me miss you so much, actually. Oh. I just got really homesick for you. <laughs> oh. Don't say it again. I'm going to get choked up. I'm going to cry. Oh, it seems like we need a Mall of America get together. We do. Uh, <laughs> or just I only see. a Wizarding World get together. Or just a get together. I don't care if we eat burgers. <laughs> and just that like. Sounds good to me. I just want to like see you guys. Anyway, I digress. Back to the movie. <laughs> Back to the movie. So we wrote down a few things that were not necessarily, like, left out of the books because we could go on and on about that, right? Like, to me, I love Peeves. He's not in any of the movies. I feel so bad for the guy. That shot the scenes. Name, that shot all the Peeves scenes. He goes to the he goes to the premiere and he realizes he's been cut from Guys, the movie. Guys, you know what God. happened? Ah. He was ghosted. Ha, ha, ha. That was the worst ha. pun I've ever made. <laughs> <laughs> okay well did you, oh i forgot about that did you see the move the the show on netflix master of none no no with with um god what's the guy's name he's from parks and rec aziz i'm sorry oh he's funny name? yeah 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 and in the show he like gets the he's an actor in the show and he gets a gig to be like this doctor in this movie where like some like mutation happens or whatever and it's the same thing that happens he goes to the premiere he invites all of his friends to go to the premiere and they cut every single one of his scenes and they're watching oh the whole movie and he's like well where was i and he, like the director's like oh yeah i didn't tell you we cut all your scenes he's like well then why did you tell me to come to the premiere and all my friends are here my parents are here uh but yeah it just reminded me when i watched that show of the fact that the Peeves guy had all of his scenes cut, Okay, too. well, let me just tell you, the guy that was supposed to play Peeves, his name is Rick Mayall, and he was a very famous British actor. He was the lead in the movie Drop Dead Fred, where he plays oh, an imaginary yeah. friend, which, like, literally typecasted, like, Drop Dead Fred could have been Peeves, like, interchangeably. Like, literally, his portrayal of Drop Dead Fred could have been Peeves. That movie was... That movie was my childhood. Like, I watched Drop Dead Fred a million times. It was my favorite movie when I was a kid. Like, still one of my favorite movies. And all I can think of is how wonderful he would have been as Peeves. And the fact that he was cut is just beyond devastating. It's horrible. Yeah. That's it. That, but it, it was just like a... It would have been uh, great. But it, it would have been, been... It would have been great. <laughs> it would have been, I think, too difficult for them to even... I guess work some of those things in at least with what they were trying to do with their overall vision. I mean, he could have been it just as like frequently as like John Cleese was for yeah. Nearly Headless Nick. Like he was barely yeah. in the movies, but he was still in the movies a little bit. I right. loved so, him as Nearly Headless Nick. Yeah, it was he was great. I mean, the fact that they have to like there are pretty like pivotal plot points that like Peeves takes part in in mm-hmm. the, in the grand scheme of things, and in the movies because he was cut. They're like, well, who could we have do this instead? Oh, how about Professor McGonagall? Right. <laughs> like, okay. Like, that seems to be the exact personality opposite of Peeves. Mm-hmm. So, like, the tone of the whole scene changes. Right. So, you're like, oh, whatever. Like, it works, but. But not. It's just not. not like it did. It's not the same. 
But if you didn't know any better, right. right? And we keep going back to that point. If you didn't know any better, if you didn't know that Peeves was a thing, you don't miss Peeves. So like, but when I first met Peeves in the book, I was, I, he became instantly a favorite. He was a great comedic relief from all the really dark things going on. Well, yeah. exactly, and and because. Because they cut Peeves in the movie, I thought I think they have to find comic relief elsewhere. That brings us to another point that you talked about. Yeah. Here are other noteworthy things that are not just like, oh, we, we cut things from the book because obviously they have to cut things from the book. I mean, it was a, it's still a two and a half hour movie for a pretty modest size novel. Right. Um, but when you get towards the, the later movies, right, you have to cut even more things. So – when books become movies, things are cut. Everyone knows that. So all of that aside, um, there are some other things that all three of us noticed that were just a bit strange or odd or struck us differently as grown-ups watching this versus young children. So um, Carly or Melanie, do you want to talk about one first? Um, sure. I mean, one of the things that I thought of that – is definitely something that was a big, like, difference between the movie and the books. But, again, something that, like, you wouldn't necessarily know otherwise if you, like, had just watched the movies. Is that Hermione is just, like, very readily accepted into the friend group in the movie. It's mm-hmm. just like, oh, okay, here's the girl. Like, she does magic, whatever. She's the witch. She Like, they focus a lot on her character from the very beginning. But... Hermione as a character in the book isn't really focused on until at least halfway through. Um, She's mentioned here or there. I would say in the first half of the book, she's mentioned just about as much as Neville is mentioned. Yeah, or Dean or Seamus. Yeah, exactly. They're very tertiary. Yeah, they're all mentioned relatively equally. So that is interesting because it makes you feel like you don't know who's going to be an important character or not. And it's not until the troll scene that they become friends and it's even the last sentence of that chapter says something along the lines of, you know, there's some things that you can experience with people and you just can't help but become friends after it. And fighting off a troll is one of those things. And that's... I have it in front of me. Do you you want me to read it to you? Yeah, you could. You were so close. Aw, thanks. Uh, (laughs) From that moment on, Hermione Granger became their friend. There are some things you can't share without ending up liking each other and knocking out a 12-foot mountain troll is one of them. Yeah, so you were so close. Oh, thanks. Awesome. It's it's been a little while. Um, but that's that I feel like is like a huge part in the book because now, okay, Hermione is their friend. She helps them with their homework. They do all of these things together, right. and she really becomes like this huge character. Plus, she obviously. lied for them. Like she lied for them to the professors over that moment. Exactly. Like that's the they. they that's the moment that changed the rest of the series because it they go from being a duo to a trio at that moment. Right. Um, and the movie, I feel like, doesn't really captivate no, that at all. Because you see there... It doesn't... It doesn't... Oh, go ahead, I was Carly. just going to say, like, when I saw the movie first, you know, I was really shocked when I got to the book at how mean they were to Hermione at first. Because in the movie, she was just always hanging around. Like, they may have been rolling her eyes and whatnot, but she was still a part of their group. She was just like the snooty girl, like right. the know-it-all, whatever. Like that, that. Okay, so she's a know-it-all, but she still like really came across as like being their friend from the beginning, and that really wasn't the case. Another thing, and I we kind of talked about it too, is just like in general how I felt like they cherry picked these moments, and every every moment was like every all of, all of these important conversations happened in like a few minutes instead of. You know, so you miss some of the most important parts of it, or you just overhear the most important parts of it, but nothing else. And you're like, how would we get to here? And that's that's a great point because when I was watching this, I I kept thinking like, who is this made for? Is this made for people that are grown ups? Is it made for kids? Is it made for anyone that's read the book? Like, what is the target audience? And I mean, when I was done, I was kind of underwhelmed. So I'm thinking, well, maybe if I was even now in, in, in 2021, like if I was a 12-year-old kid, like would I enjoy this? And like you just said, if you're not paying attention to some of these important like two sentences that really move the plot forward, mm-hmm. you miss a whole chunk of really important details mm-hmm. that keeps you interested in the story. So like visually and even – 
kind of just the vibe of the movie. It's very happy and, and, and kidsy feeling almost. But there are important conversations that happen, but they're really, really fast and, and abridged and just right. not necessarily – the sp- the spotlight isn't on them as it should be, in my opinion. Like it's it's not like pay attention to this. This is important. It's like an offhanded comment, like yada yada right. yada. And then you're supposed to come back at the end of the movie, and be like, oh, I forgot he said that. Right. Like you don't remember that because it's not necessarily a big build up that you you have already created this kind of um schema around like what what the the universe of Hogwarts is. It's it's, it's just these like random isolated conversations to move the plot forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of how it felt like re uh, watching the movie again. There wasn't a lot of cohesion among a lot of scenes. Actually, there was a lot of hopping around. Yeah, I know Eric, that's something that you talked about um, with me just in general, when you were watching the movies was, Oh, okay, well, they're late to Transfiguration, and they show up, and they're late, and then the next scene is literally they're in potions. Like, all of a sudden, they're in the dungeons, and, yeah. and that's just, like, a good example of, like, the choppiness and just trying to get a lot of scenes in, but not necessarily, like, caring so much about Content. the continuity. Yeah. And they're trying to introduce all of these places, I guess, but it could, it was very choppy. They, they try to introduce the places, but, like, I never get the vibe the whole time that they're like at a school, like being students, like that, that part is kind of pushed way aside. And yeah, yeah, like they show like, yeah, they're in this class, then they're in this class, then they're in this class, but there's really no talk about like doing homework or learning things or like magic is hard (laughs) or boy, Harry (laughs) didn't know that this was a thing. Like that whole, like becoming a wizard or a witch is like, left out it's just like oh everyone's a wizard here everyone's a witch i think the one exception to that is showing like and we talked about it a little bit earlier too is um Sh- it's seamus right who keeps blowing everything up mm-hmm. yeah in the movies and i think that was also used as like a funny like comic relief point but also like maybe to show that it isn't all easy like hermione ron harry right. are like seamus is really having problems but that's really about it. Right. And that, that was one of the points that I, I wrote on our notes here that, like, I, I felt like they had to really give each character, like, a defining characteristic and just, like, that's what they're known for. So, like, in the book, it's not that way. But, like, in the movie, Seamus is known for, like, blowing up stuff. And Neville is forgetful and bad at most things. Right. Right. <laughs> And Hermione is really smart, and Ron is just kind of like kinda lazy. go with the He's flow. He's the bro, yeah, He's the bro, right? And Fred and George really aren't given much personality in the first movie, and there, there's some characters that really aren't given much personality either. And I think that kind of ends up being more difficult than to create that that personality in later movies. Yeah. When it's when it's absent in the first one, so that was something I, that the Seamus blowing up stuff thing really bothered me on my on my last watch. Like I'm like really again, like he had to blow up something. It got else. annoying on. for me, especially if you watch the extended cut. Like that's where they have the scene with like him saying like, "Oh, if you haven't noticed, my eyebrows have grown back," and mm-hmm. then he walks away, and like half of his hair is missing. Like, oh, okay, and so it wasn't funny was- at that point. At least it wasn't. But me. it might have been funny, like, the first time I watched it. Right. Like, that's... Oh, I'm sure it was. I'm sure I laughed at it. But at that time, as a younger kid, I wasn't thinking, like, well, Seamus didn't blow stuff up in the book. Like, I was just thinking, like, there's Seamus Finnegan. He's on the big movie screen right. in my theater. <laughs> wow. And it made him memorable in the movies. Otherwise, I, I mean, I knew Seamus was in the books when I got to them. But I don't know that we would have remembered Seamus outside of that. So I, let's cover like two more of these big noteworthy things we wanted to mention. So Carly, did you or Melanie want to talk about Harry and Quirrell's initial interaction in the Leaky Cauldron? Um, I can jump into that okay. if you'd like. Sure. So before you jump in, that scene is awkward. Let me tell you. Yeah. I was like, 
uncomfortable watching that. Well, this I'm kind like, of oh, goes gosh. it goes back to that whole like sixth sense theory because like if you go into this movie and you already know okay, Quirrell's the bad guy, whatever. And I know that when Quirrell touches Harry at the end, like it's the touch of his mother's love and that's what yeah. kills Quirrell. That's why when you're watching the movies Quirrell noticeably does not touch Harry in the scene. Like Harry goes right. to like shake his hand and Quirrell like pulls his hands away mm-hmm. and won't touch him. And it's very noticeable with the second watch through. If like you hadn't read the books and you just watched the movie and you go to watch a movie a second time, you're like, oh my God, that's why Quirrell doesn't touch him because of Voldemort. The thing yeah. is, is in the books, it is very, very deliberate that J.K. Rowling writes that Harry shakes his hand. Right. And that's right. because he hadn't yet been possessed by Voldemort. That doesn't happen until after he screws up trying to, like, steal the stone. And Voldemort's like, I need to keep a closer eye on him. I'm going to be going to Hogwarts. Let me start drinking some unicorn blood. Get myself a half-life. And I'll just suck right. on to... <laughs> right. I'll just suck on to this guy. Yeah. they were they, But they were in cahoots. But he wasn't on his head right. yet. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that's what makes, like, that's that's a big difference. That's a big, big difference. And that's a big thing to, like, notice that, okay, this is something deliberate in the book, a deliberate plot point that, like, Harry shakes hands with Quirrell and, like, figuring out that timeline. Like, I know for me, I'm very nitpicky with the timelines. Like, I need to know, wait, this person was born this year. That makes them this year older or this person was released from Azkaban at this year or whatever. I feel like things like that are very important. And I feel like, especially if you're a reader of like Curse Child, like going into timelines is like such a deep thing and you have to kind of understand the timelines and um in order to realize what's going on with that. So like it kind of gives you this different perspective as to how to look at timelines. So understanding that Quirrell wasn't possessed actually by Voldemort to share the half-life with him until after he tries to steal the Sorcerer's Stone. Like, that's interesting. Yes. And, and it's that's a big... deliberate in the book. Yes. And it... That's one of those moments that... I don't know. There's so much about rewatching the movie that made me really uncomfortable. Because, again, it's usually background noise for me, so... I just kind of tune a lot of it out. So when I was actually paying attention, I had to t- like watch the movie and break. So it's like, okay, that's enough. Cause I was getting <laughs> frustrated with some of these things. Actually, that was, that was one. And I still get stuck on the, the ticket thing with Hagrid. It's like, <laughs> that should have gone somewhere. Why did you have this really cool line? And then nothing happens. I know. Well, and I think Melanie, to your point about like the, Like, the focus on Quirrell, I mean, they focus on him in the book, but only upon, like, finding out that he was the bad guy do you realize that, like, oh, wow, like, that's why they talked about him. But I feel like in the book, they also talk about the other teachers a lot as well. Like, they mention Professor Sprout and Flitwick a Mm -hmm. lot in the books. Mm -hmm. They mention Madam Hooch a lot. Professor Binns. They talk about all these other people that are there. don't get me started on Professor Hooch. Yeah, he's not – he's not – Oh, Madam Hooch? Madam Hooch? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, we can talk about her. That can be a whole other yeah. topic. Um, <laughs> but the movie, it's like, oh, there is like Dumbledore, Snape, McGonagall, and Coral. And then there's this Flitwick guy that teaches charms. And I think there's a, other people that sit at the teacher table, but not really. Like, right. it's, like the, these are your main people. And then they really focus on, like, scenes where Snape and Quirrell are together. They're together at the Quidditch match. They're together when Harry's trying to get the book out of the restricted section in the library. Um, Quirrell meets him in the Leaky Cauldron. Right. They show Quirrell um, – they actually – McGonagall gets uh, Oliver Wood out of Quirrell's class in the movie instead of Flitwick's class in the book, I think, to show another scene that Quirrell's in there. So you're like – Oh, he's so important, you know but he, it can't right. be him. And you see it too right. in the sorting, like when they're sorting when they first get to Hogwarts, they are one al- unalphabetized. That is something I did ask my sister about when I watched it the first time. Oh, because boy. yeah, they they only sort like five, right? Kids. And they're all out <laughs> of like, order. Oh. And it's like, yeah, I asked her. I said, "Is it why did they do that?" And she was like, "It's different in the book." Is all she really told me. 
But I think it's to pinpoint who the big people were. So that way you knew, I guess, as an audience yeah. member to pay attention to them. Right. So, um, Carly, do you want to talk about the coral in the Forbidden Forest part? <sighs> yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All I could. And then there's only one, only one more after this. And I, then we well, it, move no, no, on. no. I don't mind. It's just. It's one of those moments, like I was sitting there watching it, and all I could think of as um, cor- um, cor- uh, when he's sucking the, the it, unicorn blood, yeah. all it reminded me of was like the scary, not even scary, like the funny skeleton ghost guys at Halloween that are battery operated when you walk in front of them and they're like, ooh, like that, and they shake around. Like that's what it reminded me of. So I couldn't even take that scene seriously, like when I was rewatching it. Um, in fact, that's where I stopped. I had to take a break. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, like, <laughs> and I know that it's not even because cin- cinematography has changed. We've seen great movies from earlier times that that stuff I don't even hinge on because the script itself is so well done. But that part really, like I said, I had to take a break from watching it. It was like, okay, we've we've done enough. I think the only other thing I wanted to really mention that was kind of like, uh, was that Hagrid makes a really good point of what, like, Harry's like, Snape's trying to sneal it. And he's like, Cod Swallow. Oh, yeah. Snape's one of the teachers protecting the stone, which we all know from reading the books. But then when Harry actually goes through the trap door, they only do, like, two-thirds of the, through the like, trap door. quote, unquote, mm-hmm. challenges mm-hmm. through the trap door. Like, they don't even do the Snape one, mm-hmm. which, like... When Dumbledore gives Hermione the points at the end during the feast, it's, like, for use of cool logic in the face of fire. And he's, like, directly referencing that Hermione figured out Snape's logic puzzle to figure out which potion to drink to get through the flames. And that's not in the movie at all. So, like, one, what did Snape do to protect the stone? Like, did he, like, make the door out of the wood? Well, maybe it's, like, referencing the fact that, like... He knew that Quirrell was after it, and he kept, like, cutting Quirrell off, like, yeah. fluffy. Like, it, it could have been something sure. like that. Which, not for nothing, that's one of the things that bothers me, is that, like, okay, Harry literally witnesses Filch talking to Snape about, like, oh, someone tried to get to the third floor, blah, 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 like... How are you supposed to keep your eyes on all three heads at once? Yeah, at exactly. Two? Like, oh, he knows about Fluffy, like... Uh, like th- there's like this common knowledge about Fluffy, but then like Harry's still convinced that Snape is the bad guy. Right. Like, right. Doesn't make much. Whereas sense. in the movie, it's like very much like they want you to be like Snape's bad. He's mm-hmm. bad. Right. Look at him. He's bad. He's bad again. Look at this. He's limping. He's right. bad. And then that look he gives and after the, end, the troll, like... you know, when he's cut his leg. Was, pr- was yeah? Because really that's what they show that he. That's that's what they show he cut his leg. Yeah. Well, and he's. I keep thinking about even reading the books no, too. Like, he was, I mean, this kid teaches. He teaches eleven-year-old kids, and he's like the meanest guy ever. <laughs> and as a teacher, I'm like, if I was like that to any of my kids, man, I'd be out of there so yeah. fast. Like, there's, there's no. You, you can't. You just can't treat kids like that. Anyway, all right. Well, so we could probably go on about this forever and ever, and you will get to hear us do that about the rest of the movies <laughs> when we decide to talk about them. I think at the end of the day, a good way to, like, wrap this up is, like, we love Harry Potter and we love the movies, love even though, like, we're being, like, really, like, nitpicky on them and judgy on them right now. Like, these movies are still, like, a huge part of my life and my childhood and, like, I still love them and have great love for them, even though they, like, drive me crazy. Right. Like, that. that's it. Still love them. Yeah. Same. Same. I do <sighs> think they start to get better, though, after really the first two, but. I agree. I also. But we'll yeah, talk we about, talk that, about that, that later. Another, it's just, I feel like another that has time. to be said. Well said. All right. Well, let's let's quickly move on to the translation of the show before we end. I don't think we're going to have time for a listener question, but we do want to talk about this book because it is a good one. Yes. So the translation of the show this week da, 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 is Hawaiian. Whoa. What? I Hawaiian. was so excited when I found out about this. 
Uh, I, I really it's was. It's so good. So good. What's cool about this book, and we've mentioned in the past, is this is one of the like relatively new translations that we've gotten. This was the first translation that I bought when it came out. I think so it was cool. mine too, actually. Yeah, I feel I I think that's probably accurate. Like I think all the other ones it was like playing catch up and it was, oh wait, there's a new translation coming out. It's Hawaiian. Yeah. Um and I can just buy it from the publisher. That's right. Um, so this book was published in 2018, I believe, by Evertype. Um, it features features <laughs> um, features features. Okay, it has the Thomas Taylor cover art on it, um, the- which I think is weird because Hawaiian is a U.S. state. I know. Hawaii is. And they didn't go with the Grand Prey art. I'm like, what? Yeah. I know. Pretty cool. I actually kind of dig it. Like, I'm kind of cool with the fact that they did that. Um, I wonder if they did it just to make it stand out in any bookstores in Hawaii. Possibly. I have. definitely think that that might be the case because just in doing, like, a little bit of research about, like, the Hawaiian language, it is, like, a dying language. Um, so I think that... Most people in Hawaii are going to read Harry Potter in English, so they need a way for it to stand out a little bit on the shelves. Um, So that kind of makes sense a little bit as to why they would do a different cover. Um, Hawaiian in general, it's a Polynesian language, um, and it is a main language in Hawaii as well as English is. Um, But it is uh, as of 2001 so this is already 20 years, 20 years ago. ago um it, the hawaiian native speaker like population is down to less than 0.1% statewide yeah. that is so sad to think of um so yeah. oh. so hawaiian is actually like considered to be an endangered language which like Yep. Looking at that as like a link from a linguistic perspective, like that is very interesting. That it is like a little dying language. It, they do though, like I know that when this book was published, there's a huge push for people to like keep this language alive. Totally. Right? They did not want it to die. And in Hawaii, I've not been there personally, but I know lots of people that have, including my wife. And a lot of the signs, like the street signs, are in both English and they Hawaiian. Are. Yeah, there's definitely that push to try to keep the language alive. And from what I've looked into about it, like, that's one of the big reasons why this book came out is because they really wanted to um, have, like, a reawakening of the language. Right. So I know they teach it in some of the schools there because I've got friends from Hawaii, like, from some of the different islands. And then I've got friends that are, like, their mom is from Hawaii and all of them know at least smatterings of Hawaiian even if not being able to like read or converse in it they can at least say like my name is I'm from I would like things like that a little bit more about this book um well I don't know do we want to get into like our little reading scale for it or maybe we should talk about the fact that like this book is not a rare book it is easy to come by um and still easy to buy and get and have on your shelves if you want it right. and it's a very cool book to have um i think you can still get it off the publisher i'm pretty sure you can as well and the publisher um, is actually only one guy he translated all of the alice in wonderland pretty much that's really interesting yep so- including alice in wonderland in qr code or wow or barcode it's one of the two if not <laughs> both it is oh wow yeah all right well If we get into our rating scale for this book, you open it up and take a nice smell. I would I would rate it as an acceptable. I feel like it's neither here nor there. It's not like a fantastic smelling. I like it. I'm giving it an E. An E. An E for Eric. (laughs) Eric with an E. Eric with an E. Amazing. I would just say it's. I mean, it's except it doesn't smell like anything to me, so I'll say it's acceptable. Yeah. Um, size and proportion of the books. I feel like it is a very nice sized book. I would agree. By width, it is very nice. I would give that probably an exceeds expectations. 
Um, I agree. I love how and the cover for... feels, like the texture of the cover feels in my hand. That's not this category. We talk about it every, every time. Week, we have Carly. to wait. Sorry. <laughs> how the book feels in your hand. <laughs> That's its own is category. It's next category. I so, how the book, I know, how the book feels in your hands, I would give this book an outstanding for sure. Oh, I say, oh, for outstanding. Oh, for outstanding. It is a nice, soft, buttery texture. Yes. It is, you could tell even for a paperback, it is like, it It just is like, it's just nice. It feels good. I've honestly sat yeah. and played with the cover like most of the recording because I just love how it feels so I much. know. Same. It's so good to just like run your hand over. And I it's, love like, very how nice. like when my hand wraps around the spine. Yeah, it's it's just, it is just a nice book in your hands. Yeah. Um, As for the quality of the book, I would give it and exceeds expectations. I feel like even for a paperback, it holds up very nicely. The spine is nice and tight. The cover is nice and thick for a paperback. Um, and it definitely, for the few years that it's been on my shelves, has held up quite nicely. I would so agree. I would give that a, a nice rating. It's a great book. Um, it is a great book. And then for the cover art, like interpretation of the cover art, I think just based on what we were talking about before, about the fact that it's an American book, but it has the Thomas Taylor art, like I give that an exceeds expectations. I would have loved to have seen some like, I don't know, some Hawaiian style yes. artwork, but I appreciate that they went with Thomas Taylor instead of Mary Grandpa. Yeah. I think that that's pretty nice. I they also did very subtly, like the the color of the words Harry oh, Potter. Oh, that was just like, what I'm I was going to say. It, you took the words out I'm of my head. I'm comparing it directly. I'm comparing it directly to a soft cover, a Bloomsbury version, which is actually the first uh, UK version that I ever had. Um, it's it's more of a dark kind of. It's like mustardy, yeah, almost, very mustardy. almost mustardy, almost a little green in yeah. there too. Versus mm-hmm. like the uh, UK, which is just very strictly like almost a yellowish gold. Right. And that yep. color. is the That's one nice. thing that bothers me. Yeah, it, but but I appreciate that it's a little bit different. And I think something that we should talk about in the future is that the amount of the picture, the Thomas Taylor illustration, it's a little bit different. You get to see a little bit more in the UK yeah. version than you do in the Hawaiian version. And this is not the first time I've noticed that. There are a couple other ones that are either zoomed way in or zoomed out farther. Right, that's so, a good point. Uh, you get you get to see more or less of the um, cover illustration. Well, which here's is cool. another little fun fact that I just noticed, and then um, we could wrap things up. But I love the fact that they translated Hogwarts Express from the illustration into Hawaiian. Yeah, I just yeah. saw that. Which that that's not done. Like I have Sinhala in front of me from last week. I have Scott in front of me. They all say Hogwarts Express. This isn't it done in one of the Macedonian ones. It, it maybe it's, I don't have I don't have those in front of me. These are just the two that are like in closest proximity. But I love that they translated it into Hawaiian. So cool. So well that was done. super creative. I mean, okay, that okay. I don't care about the nice. color of Harry Potter. They win with that. <laughs> Like that's the kind of detail though that like when they borrow a cover art, we talked about this last week. When they borrow cover art, it's fine if if you make it fit the book that you're translating. If you just literally copy and paste it and put it on there, there's going to be things that look cheap or look copied or look like they cut corners. Right. Whereas like translating the front of the train like shows you that they actually paid attention to it. They didn't just like do this in two minutes. Right. They actually thought about it. So I sincerely appreciate that. Yeah, I do too. All right. So uh, I don't think we'll have time for a question today. That's okay because I bet our next episode will be all questions. <laughs> Which because we have – I'm looking forward to. Them. I love those I episodes. Too. They're really We have fun. A, lot of them, uh, a lot of them backed up. So we need to unload some questions at some point. So – uh, that is all the time we have today. I hope you enjoyed listening to us talk about movies or a movie specifically. So if you want to get in touch with us, you can find us on Instagram. I'm on there at Nocturne Eric. Carly is on there at All the Pretty Books. And Melanie is on there at the Harry Potter Collection. You can also find this podcast on Instagram at Dialogue Ellie Podcast. If you'd like to get in touch with the podcast in general – uh, you can send us an email to our Gmail, which is dialoguealleypodcast at gmail.com. You can find our podcast that you're currently listening to on whatever service that you're currently listening to it on, 
Um, it's also on Apple, Google, Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, if you know what that is. I don't, but it's on there. Um, as well as some other things. You can have your smart speaker play it. Uh, you can have your friend uh, just just listen to it and then tell you what happened. If you do like what you're hearing, we would appreciate if you leave us a review on whatever platform you do listen to the show on. It really helps us grow as a podcast, and it lets us know what we're doing great, and if there's anything we need to fix or do better at, um, we would love to do that, because we are doing this for ourselves, but we are also doing it for you, our listeners. Um, and with that, we'd also like, if you do enjoy it, to tell your friends to listen to it. Uh, do what Carly does and just go to the end of her block and scream it to the street once Every a day. day. <laughs> and then she walks home and then everyone goes, okay. Or just show them the new Lithuanian home. book one and be like, listen to my podcast. Yep. So uh, with that, um, <laughs> oh, you guys cracked me up. <laughs> so with that, it's time to walk back through the archway and back into your daily lives and we will catch you next time on the next episode of the Dialogue Alley podcast. Bye everybody. Bye. See ya.